How you going, guys? Happy Hump Day. We've made it to Wednesday in the week. Um, yeah, I'm calling in from not so sunny Adelaide at the moment. It is yeah, overcast and raining, which uh, is a, a change. Yet it's been hot and dry for a very long time. So as as Jen said, I'm a I'm a physio by trade, and then delved in the dark side of ultrasound. Um, currently, I'm working at a specialist musculoskeletal practice, Fallis Simmons Radiology in Adelaide. Uh, I realised I was no good at general ultrasound and that musculoskeletal was a better fit for me. So I'm going to talk a bit about more, about, more of a holistic assessment of plantar metatarsalgia. Um, I, find, I find it's an area that's it's done really poorly in, in ultrasound. Um, I'm not sure why. It, it, it's not that hard. There's, there's literally about four things to assess in each toe and you just need to do it five times, or if you're doing a bilateral full feet study, you, you do it a few times. So you're going you're gonna to assess a few structures, but it's a matter of being meticulous and, and going through a bit of a checklist and a bit of a routine, and, and you won't miss things. You'll get better outcomes for patients, and you'll do really well. So let's, let's talk about a few things. Now, why do people get plantar metatarsalgia? Why do people get full foot pain? So let's talk about our forefoot load. The load on the foot should be evenly distributed between your first and your fifth metatarsals. Okay, there should be a little bit more load spread on under the first metatarsal, but overall it should be pretty general. And especially when you go up onto the ball of your foot, you want a, a nice even spread of load. You have two arches in your foot. You have your medial longitudinal arch, which is the, the general arch of your foot that you would know about. And then you have your, your transverse arch. You should have a small arch under your metatarsals. With your second and third metatarsals, when you're not weight-bearing, your second and third metatarsals should be slightly elevated away from the first and fifth. They should be slightly lifted so when you weight bear, forces put through those metatarsal heads and evenly distributed. So you get pain because the load is not. You can have too much load. And uh, really the, the death of most metatarsalgia is high heels. Okay, that's what causes a lot of things. So those, those glamorous high heels. Um, so what, what happens when you go in a set of high heels? You, you get up that weight gets shifted from your calcaneus down all the way, all onto your metatarsal heads, all onto your plantar plates, all onto your transverse and metatarsal ligaments. A lot of stress gets put down there. And then you have the people who are living in constant high heels, the cavus foot type, that really high arch feet. They tend to be the ones, you know, if 15% of the population have high arch feet, and they're the ones who have most metatarsalgia problems. They're probably 50% of your metatarsalgia patients. Have a look at people's feet type. Have a look at the next foot that comes in for forefoot pain. And you'll, you'll find that most of them have a, have a high foot. <coughs> the other area people get in trouble is if they have a, a tight calf, tight Achilles, which will increase the load within their forefoot when they go into the toe-off stance of their gait, as they get onto the ball of their foot, you get onto it a bit earlier if you tighten the calf. And also having more load. So overweight people, you know, it's an it's a epidemic at the moment, isn't it? The other, the other spectrum you have are people with altered biomechanics. So people with hallux rigidus, with osteoarthritis, that first metatarsal, People bunions, okay, pushing, compressing that into metatarsal space, and the people with long second toes, with that with that long hammer toe, okay, that's going to put a lot more stress throughout the structures and force the toe up. So when we go through, when we assess a foot, what do we assess first? Well, just like anything we assess, whenever we have a look at any other musculoskeletal structure in the body, assess the joint, okay? 
always have a look at the joint. Same as when you have a look at a shoulder. Same as when you have a look at a hip. Same as when you have a look at a toe. You assess the joint. So always have a look at your metatarsal phalangeal joints. Now, the tip is to you know, use a really light touch, especially when you're using colour Doppler assessment, uh, as you guys are, I'm sure will be very aware. But uh, if, you, if you can relax that foot, lots of gel, you know, gel standoff, uh, take that foot out of a weight-bearing environment and use the SMI if you've got it. You, you'll see that neovascularity. You'll see that active inflammation going on in that synovial proliferation of the joint. You see it a lot if you look for it. Now it's important, really, really important, not to miss the blatantly obvious, and you won't see it if you don't look. So assessing for stress fractures, assessing for Freiburg's infarction. We've got a we've got a rule in our clinic where we work. Anyone who's a, a middle to long distance runner with foot pain has a stress fracture and until proven otherwise, okay? And uh, about 80% of the time you'll be right. So always have a look, have a look, assess the metatarsal shafts of the sorma shaft, from the demitus foot, assess the periosteum, assess the fat pads surrounding that metatarsal shaft. The other thing to have in the back of your mind is your Freiburg's infarction, the avascular necrosis, due to a ischemic event, usually of a second or third metatarsal head, um, you, you see the, the cortical irregularity of this, this metatarsal head here, it gets that flattening. Um, you, you see it on your plane rays, you see a little bit of flattening on there and MRI really really shows up nicely. But you can, you, you can pick that up on ultrasound, you see the synovitis and you see an abnormal bone underneath. Well, it's, it's quite easy. Have a look, put it together with your clinical picture. You know, your, your stress fractures are in your runners, your Freiburg infarction are usually in young girls, teenage to early 20 girls, usually second to third metatarsals. The other thing as we're assessing these joints is to assess for gout. Okay, ultrasound is a fantastic tool for assessing gout and it's, it's really, really good for for having a look at, at toe joints. You know, most of the time where people get gout is their first MTP joint. That's the most symptomatic joint. Usually the first presentation of gout is, is pain, swelling, redness in their big toe. An ultrasound can pick it up and you can see it really nicely. So you see that monosodium urate crystal deposition. So it shows up as your echogenic crystals on top of the hyaline cartilage. Not within, would be CCPD, but on top. So you get the, the nuchal translucency of the toe, if you like. Okay, those two parallel lines really highlighting off that cartilage. You see the, see the synovial and the fat edema associated with it. Gout is common. If the patient has had negative blood tests for gout, don't let that allow you to rule gout out of the equation. About 30% of people with active gout have negative blood results. Okay, so just because they have negative blood for gout doesn't mean they don't have it. If you aspirate some of that synovium and run that off the crystals, that will come back positive. Also, have a look underneath the foot. Don't just assess the top, but assess the bottom. We have a look here under this first toe. We have a look under the plantar plate, which we'll go and we'll talk about quite extensively in a minute. But we're having a look under the plantar plate. You see that nuchal translucency appearance. Those crystal deposition on top of the cartilage. You often see associated synovitis of the flexor tendon. And if you, if you look at this, if you imagine this was ECU of the wrist, okay, and you saw synovitis around ECU of the wrist without without any history of trauma or history of incident or repetitive overuse, you think a, a systemic arthropathy. Okay, so it's exactly the same with the foot. When you see tenosynovitis coming from around a joint, think it's coming from a joint. Think it's a, a systemic arthropathy. Be suspicious. Do they have do they have gout? Do they have rheumatoid? Do they have psoriatic arthritis? Um, be suspicious. 
Now, let's get down to business, the plant of plates. Alrighty, so these are, these are things that are, they're really easy to assess if, if you know what you're looking for. And we're going to try to work that out today. We're going we're gonna to go through this systemically, uh, sorry, systemically, systematically, okay, and, and talk about what we look at, how we do it, and, and what's the best way to assess these plates. So the planar plate, it's a fibrocartilaginous structure, okay? So it's the same stuff that labrum's made out of, the same stuff the spring ligaments made out of, the same stuff the unoccupied fibrocartilage of your tibialis posterior and insertion is made out of. So it gives you that, that mottled grey appearance. It doesn't look like well-organised collagen like a ligament. It's fibrocartilaginous. Okay, it's uniform grey. That's what you're looking for on ultrasound. So what are they? What are these planar plates everyone raves on about? Well, they're the same as the palmar plates in your hand. They're anchoring points. It's the outside of a joint capsule. So if we have a look at these toes here, it's the outside of a joint capsule, which is thickened up. Okay, that capsule is thickened up, and it's made of unossified fibre cartilage. So instead of it being so much collagen, it's more unossified fibre cartilage, and it's thick. It's thick because lots of things plug into it. Okay, the deep fibres of your plantar fascia insert down into each toe, the intermetatarsal ligaments, the collateral ligaments of the joint, the interosseous tendons, so your lumbricals and your dorsal and palm, um, dorsal and ventral interossei, and your flexor tendon sheaths come out from here, same as with your with your A1 pulley in your hand, the, the pulley of the flexor tendon originates from this plate. For some reason, uh, you know, Netto with his diagrams cool, calls it a red, the flexor retinaculum, but really it's a pulley, it's the same as your A1 pulley in your hand, in your fingers, with your trigger finger. So it's unossified fibrocartilage. If it gets too much load, it gives up. So it becomes degenerative due to repetitive micro-injury. Now, plantar plate tears can often be symptomatic. Okay, so it's really, really important that you correlate it with the patient's symptoms. If a patient comes in and they used to have a straight toe and now it's crooked and bent and it hurts, it's a symptomatic plantar plate. If you have your 90-year-old lady who comes on in with a big bunion crossing over toes, she's going to have a, a decent plantar plate tear, but it, it's whether that's symptomatic, palpate it, palpate the joint, palpate the plate, see if you can reproduce their symptoms. Okay, so you're looking for a, a reproduction of symptoms rather than just pain. You know, if you dig your fingers in hard enough into most 90-year-old ladies' feet, they're going to say, yes, that hurts, but you're looking for, is that where you get your pain? So having a look at this, you know, this is one we, we snapped the other day. Um, crooked toe, a bit of a bunion. Look at your plane rays. We've got a crooked toe. Straight away, you know there is a significant plate tear here. Without putting the probe on, this person has a plantar plate tear of their second toe. Okay, so what do they get? They get this thong sign, or I don't know if we've got anyone from New Zealand, the jandal sign. Right, so when you when you put your song on, it should sit between your first and second web space. When Moses parts the toes, okay, and they're going between your second or third or third and fourth, if your song wants to slip in between those toes, then you, you get this, what we call the song sign. You get the separation of the toes. It's indicative of a plantar plate tear. You're either going to have a big neuroma there or a significant plantar plate tear really, really common in your second and third interspaces. You get a bit of a hammer toe and splaying of the toes. Now, all right, let's, let's have a look at a few things. I, I find it really hard doing webinars because I'm just sitting in my office talking to a computer, which, which is weird. Um, and I like talking with my hands. I'm talking with my hands at the moment, but you can't see it. So uh, I like to try to explain what's going on with these feet, why do your toes splay when you tear your plantar plate? 
So I thought, I know you're sitting at home and going, what does this guy's foot look like? Well, here you go. And I found out my toes are quite hairy <laughs> using this. So apparently I need to wax my toes, but that's all right. Let's, let's have a look at this. Uh, I screwed this up last night. I'm trying to figure it out. So if we have a look, most common plantar plate tears have a lateral aspect of your second toe. Okay, Tearing that lateral aspect of your second toe of your plantar plate causes that thong sign to appear between your second and third toe. So why does that happen? Why when you tear there does your, your toe go skew if? Why does it separate? Well, if we think about what happens, our, our plantar plate is continuous with our collateral ligaments anchoring on down, anchoring our metatarsal onto our, sorry, our metatarsal onto our proximal thalamus. So we have our collateral ligaments and the lateral margins of the plantar plate. If you tear the lateral margin of your plantar plate, move this side, the static stabilizer of that metatarsal phalangeal joint becomes insufficient. Okay, So it allows the proximal phalanx to deviate medially. So your toe twists on over. You start to get the crossing of the toes. So you get your thong sign, you have your first and second toes that start to cross over each other, and you can get a bit of a hammer toe, and, and it wriggles up and, and gets in the way, gets caught on shoes. You get a, get a callus on the top of your IP joint. So a hammer toe and a callus on top of the IP joint. You think plantar plate tear. Just by having a look at the foot, you can pick it. It's easy. So how good does ultrasound at looking at them? It's really good. Right? Really, really good. Um, much more sensitive than MRI because uh, you get get the really, really thin slice thickness, you know, resulting down to 0.1 of a mil. You, you get a better slice thickness than MRI and you can assess it dynamically, which is what gives you all your information. We'll talk about that in a minute. So as I said, your plantar plate coming over from the metatarsal to the proximal phalanx and inserting it onto the proximal phalanx with your collateral ligaments going around and inserting on in same as what you see anatomically, your plantar plate going over onto your proximal phalanx, your metatarsal head, the flexor tendon with the flexor vinculum going over top. So what happens, you tear this bit of cartilage and the part that tends to tear first is the deep component. So you get these partial plate tears. The deep component tears, then it extends on to being a complete tear, then they extend on to being a complete transection tear. And we'll talk about these. So the partial plate tear. Think of this. Think of this image here, like we're assessing a supraspinatus in short axis. Okay? You're looking at that supra and you go, okay, I've got a patchy area underneath. How would you describe this? You, you describe it as an articular surface, intra uh, partial thickness tear of the supraspinatus. So your partial tears are usually your articular surface or intrasubstance tears that you get within your plate. Your complete tears go from articular to bursal surface. So from your articular surface up through the plate, the whole thickness. Your complete transection tears are the ones that are complete tears, but also full thickness and AP diameter. Okay, so instead of it just being a, a full thickness tear in the anterior, part of the plate, or in this case the lateral part of the plate, it's a, it's a full thickness tear, the whole width, so from the anterior to posterior or medial to lateral approach. So that's your complete transection tear. Now, how do you differentiate between them? You know, how, do you, how do you differentiate between a complete and, and complete transection? Well, you need to move the toe. You need to move these joints. So if we have a look, how do we scan these? Well, you get them plantar side of the foot, put your probe over the metatarsal head, and give it a wriggle, right? It's not that hard. Where people go wrong with this is they don't take the toe into full range, full end of range dorsiflexion to really assess what's going on. So if we, to wake everyone up playing at home, <coughs> I want you to grab your finger, okay? Pick one, any one. You've got eight of them and a couple of thumbs. Pick one and take it into extension. 
So when you take your finger back, you start to feel a bit of resistance. And then you can push it another, you know, 10, 15, 20 degrees to end range. Okay, so you, you can do the same with toes. You can do the same with a symptomatic toe and it doesn't hurt. So don't just give it a little wriggle. Take it all the way back till it stops bending back. It doesn't hurt. And that's how you put the plantar plate on stress. That's how you can have a good look through the whole thing. Give it a wriggle, take it all the way to end range. So let's have a look at some movement. What do we see? We have a look at our normal plantar plate here. We've got our proximal phalanx, sorry, our metatarsal head and our proximal phalanx. We're taking this proximal phalanx into dorsiflexion, into end range dorsiflexion and having a look at this plate. Seeing how it moves. And you see how the plate all moves as one with that proximal phalanx. Okay, it all moves back, all pulls back. Nice, uniform, homogeneous, unossified fibrocartilage. Then things go a bit wrong. Have a look at this one, just scanning through, and let's give it a wriggle. See how it's spongy. See how it's deformable in this deep aspect. We'll play this again. Scanning medial to lateral. Having a look at that lateral component, we see that our deep defect. If we pause this here, let's go back a bit in time. Have a look here. If this was, as I said, let's go back to our super analogy. If this was super spinatus and short axis, what do you see here? Well, it's similar to like a highland cartilage sign, isn't it? You know, you're starting to see the underside of the cartilage of that metatarsal head a bit well because you've got a bit of fluid over top. It's emphasizing it there. As you stress the toe, it becomes really apparent. So it's scanning through the bulk of it and then moving it. See how it's spongy. It elongates in this deep component. So this is our partial plate tear. Great to see with our high frequency probes. Get such good resolution. You pick them up so, so often. Then we progress to our full thickness plate tear. <coughs> so if you have a look at this statically, it's, it's hard to assess, is it a full thickness tear or is it a partial? But if you move it dynamically, we can see that tear continues all the way up to where our flexor tendon is. We can see the separation, the pulling away. This is our full thickness tear. See some nitrogen bubbles cavitating, extending out. Sometimes you can get them to extend up into the plate tear. Then we have our complete transection tears. So I'll wait anxiously for my clip to load. Let's go back. There we go. All right, so our complete transection tears. These are your complete tears, full thickness, okay? Complete full thickness tears. So this toe, this metatarsal phalangeal joint is completely unstable. See how you can move the proximal phalanx independently. It's getting a rock on that metatarsal. Okay, It's able to, to translate itself more than AP diameter as it rocks through. It's moving independently. As you move it, the plate doesn't move. It stays independent. It stays back here. A complete full thickness tear, complete transection. So this is where your orthopedic uh, surgeons or your podiatrists will say, you know, increase the anterior draw. What they do is they put a, an AP stress on the toe, an anterior to posterior directional stress, and see if they can sublux that toe, see if they can get it to almost dislocate. And these ones will, they'll, they'll separate out because there's no stability. The other thing that's really, really useful is assessing the plate with our SMI. So having a look through the plate, look at your flexor, look at your plate, and you go, okay, this is a bit dodgy, it's got a big hole in it. All right, we've got that. Is it, is it an acute tear, is it a chronic tear? Is it actively inflamed? So not only correlating with your patient's symptoms, but you can have sonographic evidence to back it up. So having a look with your SMI, having a look at that plate, 
and you see the neovascularity. You see those micro vessels infiltrating around the edema within the plate, the edema within the flexor tendon, the interstitial fat getting inflamed. So use your SMI on your plates. You'll see it. Uh, you wouldn't have seen it before, but if you use your SMI, it'll, it'll show it up really nicely. So rule of thumb, move the toe. <laughs> it drives me nuts. You know, that's the beauty of ultrasound. We can be dynamic. So use it to your advantage. The other things you you'll see is you assess the, the plates. Uh, what we what we often see are these little paraplate cysts. Okay, so these paraplate cysts, similar to a parameniscal cyst. Okay, so it's a little bit of joint fluid, a little bit of synovial fluid extending on out. So if we have a look here. We have a little paraplate. We have a, a partial plate cyst. And it goes out, and you see it go out and extend onto and into that paraplate cyst. So you see these little bits of fluid up here. These aren't flexor tenosynovitis, as, as I often seem called. They're, they're little extrusions of joint fluid. Have a look here in short axis. Okay, here's our plate in short axis. You know, how nice our resolution that we get when we have our precision turned up a little bit. Put your precision on you know, two or three and you, you, can, you can resolve down through these plates. So we have a look at this plate and in short axis and you can see the little neck going down, communicating down to that joint. You know, if this was a wrist, that would be a ganglion coming out of our scaphoid ligament in our wrist, coming down, extending through. So it's joint fluid extruding out. The other thing you need to do is look outside, have a look on top. So do you have interstitial bursitis? Okay, you know, It's often associated with a plate tear where you get an extrusion of the joint fluid. When you have a full thickness plate tear, you have extrusion of the joint fluid going out into those interstitial tissues, inflaming all that fat. So is it associated with a plate tear? Use the SMI. Have a look. Is it inflamed? Is it vascular? Is look at all this edematous fat down here. You see the inflammation around our flexor tendon, which we'll talk about a bit in a sec as well. Inflammation of that fat, that interstitial or adventitial bursa. Is it an acute one? Is it actively inflamed, or is it a chronic one, where the fat's been worn away? You know, have they, they popped the bubbles of their their packing bubble wrap? Okay, is that fat degenerative? Are they weight bearing on their plate, on their metatarsal heads? It's just pushing just with our probe. And look, if they put their weight down through there, they're going to be weight bearing on that plate, weight bearing on that flexor tendon. And that's not a nice thing to have. Okay, that's going to get inflamed. It's going to get irritated. You walk around barefoot. You've got no padding under that foot. Oh, it's going to get inflamed. It's going to be sore. It's going to become symptomatic. And also having a look at your flexor tendons. So having a look for flexor tendon tenosynovitis. Have a look. Move the toe. If we go back here, we have a look. It, this could easily be be portrayed as as a hand flexor with our palmar plate, our flexor tendon, our A1 pulley going anchoring on top. We've got synovial proliferation around this flexor. It's angry, it's inflamed, flexor tenosynovitis. Having a look, put your SMI on it. See the neovascularity in that sheath around the flexor. It's inflamed, it's edematous. There's increased ground substance in the tendon. It's become a bit more hypoechoic, a bit more heterogeneous. So what do you get? Well, often, often you see this, so plantar platopathy. Is a, is a kind of term we've, we've coined. Um, so what do you get when you have a full thickness plate tear? You have a full thickness defect in that plate. You see it going from the articular surface all the way through around that flexor and into the interstitial bursa. See that extrusion down and through. So this synovial fluid gets out irritates everything, gets angry. So you get your full thickness plates here, your flexor tendon tenosynovitis and your adventitial bursa. So plantar platopathy, they've got the full house. And the feet look like this. 
Okay, toes going the wrong direction, things are inflamed, sore under their foot. The next thing we have to assess, so we've assessed our joints, we've assessed our metatarsals, we've assessed the cartilage, we've assessed our plantar plates. The next thing we do is look in between them, okay? Have a look, see what's going on. So our Morton's neuroma, our interdigital nerve. So what it is, it's a, it's a non-neoplastic fibrosis around the, the, the perineurum of the interdigital nerve. So it's a fibrosis and swelling. It's not a tumor, it's not a, not a nasty growth, it's, it's perineural fibrosis. It's thickening of the outside of the nerve. That results in altered neuronal function. So it gives you altered sensation and altered afferent function of that nerve. So they have the paresthesia, the pins and needles, the numbness, the aching pain between the toes, going down one to two toes, often a little bit non-specific, so it can be a bit vague. They go, oh, I don't know, it's my second toe, my third toe, I'm not sure, it's somewhere between there. Where do these nerves come from? <clears throat> well, they come from your medial and lateral plantar nerves. So that's the other thing, just to have up your sleeve, if someone has paresthesia between a web space, one, look at it, you know, uh, realise is it in the distribution of your deep perineal nerve, and if so, go up and trace that back. If not, have a think of where your interdigital nerves come from. They, they come from your medial and lateral plantar nerves. So do they have a tarsal tunnel issue? Is there something going on either you know, around that hot of, knot of Henry? Do they have a plantar vein thrombosis? Do they have a medial ankle joint ganglion pressing on those nerves? So your medial plantar nerve goes out and supplies your first, second, third, half of your fourth. Your lateral plantar nerve, as you can see, extending out down here, goes through, provides the interdigital nerve for your fourth and fifth and the outside of your fifth. Same as the hand, but on the foot. Okay, median and ulnar nerves, medial and lateral plantar nerves. If you've got an altered neuronal function, look until you find the cause. So why do people get neuromas? High heels, right, the death of the forefoot. Okay, so when you're in high heels, what happens? You wear these really pretty high shoes, okay? Often very pointy shoes. When you wear high heels, you're in increased MTP extension. Okay, you have a reduction of the intermetatarsal space. And that digital nerve becomes stretched because you're up in on the ball of your foot. It's, it's a neural stretch. So this long stretched out nerve is now in between your metatarsal heads, which now have less space between them. It's stretched out, it's compromised, it's vulnerable, and you're weight bearing on it. Yeah, putting your feet down, down, stomping on that nerve, making it angry, making it irritable. It gets rubbed, it gets rubbed, it gets rubbed, it thickens up, it gets angry, it gets upset, and it gives you pain. So it gets compressed and there's friction. So as, as you're getting your high heels, as you get on the ball of your foot, or if you have a very high arch foot, that plantar fascia tractions up, brings your metatarsal heads together, compresses that nerve, you walk around, you get friction between your metatarsal heads, your nerve gets swollen, it gets angry. The thing to remember is that asymptomatic neuromas are common, okay? So once you get good at looking at these, you're going to see a lot and you need to correlate. You need to correlate with the patient's symptoms. So a third of people have an asymptomatic neuroma on MR. Sonographically, a uh, study was done a while ago which showed 62 neuromas and 46 asymptomatic feet. That's a lot of neuromas. So you need to correlate with the patient's symptoms. Is that nerve angry? Is it getting inflamed? When you push on it, does it reproduce their symptoms? Do they describe the right symptoms? So how do you scan these? Okay, get in onto the plantar side of the foot. Get serious. Have a look underneath. Drift between your metatarsal heads, sit yourself in the middle, find your nerve, and apply pressure. Okay, apply that, that 
that counter pressure from the other side. Use one, two or three fingers, alter your probe angle, alter your finger angle of what way you push through to get the best image. So we add our pressure here. Having a look at our nerve, we can see our, our nerve here, nice thickness. See my finger coming in from the other side of the screen. We'll take it off. Play it again. Nerve thickens up, converts back to normal. So adding that counter pressure. Okay, our nerves, our neuroma is non-compressible. Your bursa, on the other hand, is compressible. So it's easy. You can you can differentiate these two. That's pretty good, isn't it? So you having a look here, you know, B mode, you're not too sure what's going on. You press, you can compress the bursa, and you see a nice, pretty happy nerve. Maybe a tiny bit of perineural thickening, but, but not much. Not much to get excited about. A pretty normal looking nerve tracking down in through here. So have a look with that compression, with that bimanual pressure. The other thing is your molders click. It's a great tech. I love doing a molders click. They're really good fun when you get a nice big click. <laughs> um, so how do you do these? Well, you, you put your probe in trans, open metatarsal heads. You drift a little bit towards the toes and angle back on you. And then you grab around the foot. You grab it like you're, you're holding a wet fish. And then you give it a squeeze. So you, you apply pressure between the metatarsal heads. You push them together and the nerve pops on out. So you get a nice click and often reproduction of symptoms. So that's your molders click. When you add medial and lateral compression forces through the metatarsals and the nerve extrudes itself out plantally. The tip here is you have to push quite hard with your probe as well, uh, otherwise sometimes that nerve won't kind of squeeze out. So push down hard with your probe and squeeze medial to lateral. All right. So having a look at these intermetatarsal bursts. So where do they live? They live in between the metatarsals, right adjacent those metatarsal heads on the dorsal side of that transverse metatarsal ligament. What do you see on MR? They're a little bit bright. You can get really big rheumatoid ones. Okay, If you see a massive bursa, think rheumatoid. This may be their first presentation of rheumatoid. This may be their first symptom that comes at hand. So if it's big, if it's swollen, if it's Angry, 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 think rheumatoid, they get big bursts. You can have a look at that big black bursa, big black ball, and you can use your SMI and see just how inflamed it is. So this is a, this is a true bursal neuroma complex, so there's a mixture of nerve and a mis mixture of bursa in there. Why do, why do you call it a bursal neuroma complex? Because they go hand in hand, right? A symptomatic neuroma comes along with a symptomatic bursa. Okay, same, same as in the shoulder. Okay, you have a symptomatic cuff tear, your bursa is inflamed. It's the same here, the same in the foot. Okay, our bodies work the same. So this bursa neuroma is is inflamed. So the nerves inflamed, the bursa is inflamed. So it's a bursal neuroma complex. So you go together. Now, how do you inject? This is probably the, the nicest way to inject to go on in and go. Go in between the toes, dive down in the end. So have your have your probe underneath. Set yourself up so you can you can see that nerve as you normally would, and go down in between the toes. Hurts the less, hurts the less, hurts the least, and uh, and you, you can get a bit bit of information as well. So when you when you inject, scan post injection. So bring your needle down, put it into into, into space, and inject. Feel it on up and around in there. Nice injection, all areas infiltrating. And you go, okay, what am I dealing with? Am I dealing with something that fills up nicely and there's nothing left? Or do I look and go, okay, well, here's a big, thickened nerve living that interspace. So you can see the bursa infiltrated. You can see the nerve nicely here, thickened with that perineural fibrosis with that neuroma. How do you manage these? What's the best management? Well, the best long-term management of these 
is podiatric management. So everyone we see with plantar plate issues, if they haven't come from a podiatrist, we send them to one. Okay, so podiatr podiatry management, they make these little metatarsal domes. Uh, they often do taping of the toe, do this kind of K taping, which, which holds the toe down. It can manage it symptomatically, and it can gum itself up a bit and, and scar up. You're left with a, with a deformed toe, and you have a decent plate tear or, or decent neuroma. But they don't always have to be symptomatic. You don't always need surgery for these. Podiatric management can often resolve the symptoms of these. Injection, podiatry, works quite well. The, the last thing I want to talk about is, is stump neuromas. Okay. These are quite common. People have had their neuromas chopped on out. Um, just, just something to think about when, when you have a look at a stump neuroma. Is it perineural fibrosis? Or is it just because someone's chopped the nerve and it doesn't have a, a tethering endpoint, it now retracts on itself and balls on up? So pretty much you, you know, if anyone's had much experience scanning amputees, uh, scanning nerves, you always have a, a quote-unquote stump neuroma at the end of it, uh, it's just whether it's symptomatic or not. Okay, that nerve's off tone, it's retracted back onto itself, it fibroses up around it. So you'll, you'll always have a stump neuroma. Uh, it's just whether it's symptomatic. So we can see here, uh, interdigital nerve of our uh, two, three space, and it's a big, thickened black nerve. To prove it, prove I'm not making this up, let's, let's have a look here. This is it in a long axis. Having a look along the line of that nerve, and our stump neuroma at the end. If we have a look here, okay, between our flex of tendons, so you, you go up, you trace your nerve going down. This is this one's coming from a medial plantar nerve. I'm chasing from our medial plantar nerve going down into our two three space. Having a look at our nerve, you have a look. It gets big, it gets black, it gets swollen in here. Here's our stump neuroma. Do a Tingle's test, which is tapping on the nerve, and it reproduces the symptoms. So you can see you can see stump neuromas. You can you can use ultrasound to guide either you know cortisone injections or phenol injection to kill the nerve or RF ablation to go in and zap that nerve and fry it. So ultrasound is really useful in identifying and injecting stump neuromas. Thanks, guys, and happy Wednesday. No idea how this guy does this, but <laughs> some great dexterity.